there are a lot of you in here because this is not as simple as it may seem as many of you have probably found out through like your first attempts at setting up your computer or the many follow-on failed attempts you know decades later as a seasoned Python developer still trying to do this uh, type of thing. So a little bit of intention setting. I think that's important for uh, kicking off the talk the right way. For those of you who may not be familiar, there is an Easter egg in Python uh, that gives you the Zen of Python if you import and run the this module. So I recommend to anyone who I've ever taught Python to or had the you know, pleasure of teaching them how, you know, kind of how to get started with Python is to print this out, put it in a frame, put it in your bathroom, and read it every day when you brush your teeth, you know, a couple times a day. It's, uh, it's good for the soul. It's good for more than just programming and coding, uh, but it helps just everyone on the same page about how we're going to think about this kind of a problem of getting your computer ready to be your superpower tool that is going to be the thing that you use day in, day out as the, as the role of a developer or a system engineer or whatever the role may be where you're going to be using Python, whether, whether you're a data scientist or whether you're going to be a software developer or engineer. Uh, this is a, an important one. And we're going to highlight a couple of these uh, throughout the talk, uh, and I'll, I'll get to those in a moment. But the ultimate goal here is to end up not here. Uh, some of you are familiar with XKCD. Uh, this was in April 2018, uh, Randall Monroe posted this comic admitting he had did some bad things to his computer at this point. Uh, so if you've seen this, the Python Environmental Protection Agency wants to seal it in a cement chamber. Uh, and so that was the, the alt text uh, on this specific one. But it, it was funny, it's like there's a lot of truth in this cartoon. And I can tell you from being someone who's been, I have used Python since the year 2000. Very first version of Python I ever installed was version 152, and all of this is true. And I've been through all of this stuff because I've been on a Mac or on Linux or on Windows, and I've ended up with five different installs, and I'm not sure where this Python's coming from. I'm not sure where Pip's putting something. I swear I installed something in one spot. I go over to using the project, and it's like module not found. Uh, I, can, I think we all can relate. And actually, if, if you all are, or, you know, if there's a quick question, don't hesitate to like raise your hand. I'll make sure I repeat it back. But I want to avoid this situation uh, for you all. Because Python does live in many places. Uh, it is provided by your operating system. So if you're on a Mac or if you're typically on Linux, uh, those are going to have Python pre-installed. Uh, and I know it sounds great, but be warned, um, it may not be the one for you. Uh, you may have installed Python from an app store. So for example, if you go to the Microsoft App Store, uh, there is a shiny Python uh, that you can search and install in there. Great way to get started as a new developer, uh, but may not be the right one for you either. You can download an installer from python.org. Uh, so there are some binary package installers. There are source code downloads. As a beginner, that is also daunting and confusing because you're not sure which one is going to work for you necessarily. Or you can be using a package manager. Uh, there's lots of great choices there as well. If you're on um, Debian and Ubuntu, there's apt. If you're on the other Linuxes, you're going to have yum or whatever the latest um, installers there may be. Uh, Homebrew, which is actually a personal favorite of mine, and I highly recommend it. And I'll be showing off some Homebrew stuff in this talk. If you're on Windows, there's an equivalent to Homebrew called Chocolatey. And all these will give you a way to install Python onto your machine. And you can also have Python installed via a Python distribution. So if you aren't familiar, there's, there are custom package distributions like the Anaconda Python or the Active State Python that are kind of pre-packaged and supposed to give you a great experience out of the box. But if you still are confused about these kinds of things, it may not give you that great experience you're totally expecting. So why should you care about all of this at all? It just sounds mind-numbingly boring almost to me to, to think we'd have to still be dealing with this in the year 2022. But we do, uh, because we want to make sure that everyone can stay Zen. I mentioned we were going to highlight a couple of these Zen and Python um, uh, statements, which specifically, the beautiful is better than ugly, the explicit is better than implicit, and simple is better than complex. Uh, I think one of the ways, if you've ever kind of heard the term, the ceiling of complexity, one of the ways to break through, the only way you can break through the ceiling, ceiling of complexity is to simplify. So that last one, is very important is to keep things simple until they can't be any more simple. And then we'll talk about that beautiful is better than ugly. If it feels wrong, it might be wrong. Kind of that smell test as a developer when you're going through and, and 
writing some code and you're like, ooh, this doesn't feel right. It's getting the job done, but I'm not sure about it. Same thing goes for how you're installing and using uh, Python on your local system. And I'm hoping that today we can talk about improving that process, making it more consistent, making it more simple, making it more explicit. Implicit Pythons are troublesome because you don't know where they came from, you don't know where the pip's going, you don't know where the packages are being installed into. So let's start off with some ground rules first. Some quick rules that'll keep you as safe as possible on your own computer. So again, focusing on getting this right and having that foundational base is, in my mind, just an important factor of the fact that this is how I make my livelihood. I want to have this the most awesome killer setup on my machine that you know just makes me as productive as I possibly can. But we're going to start off with this first rule, which is no sudo. You should not have to type sudo to do anything with Python. Whether you're installing Python or installing a package in Python or installing some kind of add-on for Python, there is no reason to ever use sudo. Um, I don't care, no whining. If you're using sudo to do something on your machine or administrative privileges to do something on your machine, you're probably doing something incorrect or again, it should feel wrong to you. That, that, that smell test should uh, tell you that something is, is awry if you're using sudo. I mean, the reason for this is you're most likely gonna be installing a Python package into a place that it probably shouldn't be, like in, for example, the system Python. Do not use the system Python. That Python that came on your computer, if you're on Linux or on Mac, that's not for you. That's not your Python. Uh, that Python is for use by the system itself. The installed OS is gonna be running uh, its own scripts and its own programs and own kind of cleanup tasks. Those are gonna be using the system Python. And if you upgrade out from underneath the system Python, some package that one of those scripts is, rely is relying on, you could actually be making your whole computer unstable and you're heading for a reinstall of the system or else a really terrible uh, cleanup. And don't use it for anything. Uh, that system Python is not for you again. I repeat that, not for you because that is only for the OS. So now I know you're saying, okay, this Python on my computer, but you're telling me I can't use it? What do I do, uh, smart guy? Uh, I'm going to hopefully encourage you to start down the right path. I'm gonna give you a couple quick tools and techniques that I find to be very, very useful. The first one is gonna be pyenv, and not to be confused with pipenv or pip or a million other tools that seem to be really, really similarly named. Uh, pyenv is a really, really specific, nice tool that has been open sourced that allows you to change your global Python that you would use. So if you are sitting in a terminal and you type the word Python, what you expect to have happen would actually be launching your Python that's yours, you've installed through PyEnv and not the system Python. So right now, if you didn't have PyEnv installed and you, didn't, and you typed the word Python, you're gonna be using the system Python. Again, problematic. Uh, you can have per project Python versions. Uh, now as a consultant, uh, I deal with a lot of Pythons day in, day out. Um, we've got projects that are running from Python 2.7, straight through to, I don't think anything on 3.11 yet, but definitely 3.10, um, the most recent stable version of Python, and everything in between. Uh, we've got projects on 3.7 or 3.8, 3.9, and I need to have an easy way to be able to install each of those and keep them clean so that I can now have virtual sandboxed environments so that I'm not stomping on my own self as I go and install dependencies for various projects. And then <clears throat> the, some other kind of quick tools here. This works for Linux and for Mac. Um, if you're on Windows, there is a PyEnv win, but I probably wouldn't recommend using it. And I'm gonna recommend something for Windows folks would be to investigate and seriously consider using WSL2. Uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux is very mature now, um, much faster than the original version of it, and it's gonna give you an experience that is gonna line up with a lot of like how-tos online where people are using Linux. You'll just feel like one of the gang. Uh, because basically the WSL2 gives you a full Ubuntu or full Debian or whatever you installed as your base Linux for WSL on Windows, gives you that full, full environment uh, out of the box, ready to go, and you'll be able to do everything you would see here today, just like I'm doing on my, I'm on Ubuntu here, but you can do it on Mac, you'll be able to do it on Windows, uh, just the same. So let's see this actually in, uh, in action here. Okay. So I've got my terminal and I have pyenv installed, but the way to install pyenv is gonna be, with, in my case, I use homebrew for everything. Uh, if I'm on 
Linux, there's Linux Homebrew. If I'm a Mac, the Mac Homebrew it installs the same. It has cross-platform support between the two OSs. And if you're on Windows and you're using WSL, that will work as well because you're just using Linux. So once you've done, you know, a brew install pyenv, that will get you all the way there. I already got it installed, so I don't need it. Once I've got pyenv installed, I can now see if there are versions of Python that are on this system. Uh, so it's gonna include out of the box the system Python in consideration for a Python you would wanna use. Uh, right now it's showing me my global Python is set to the 3.10.3, which is installed into a specific folder on this system, which is in my home directory. But then you see I've got a 3.8 version available, I've got a 3.9 version available, and I'll talk about those other versions up there that are named and don't have necessarily version numbers in them. They are gonna be virtual environments. But if I wanted to just type the word Python, I will get a 3.10.3 uh, Python environment. And that's just the one that's installed from pyenv. So I didn't use sudo, I just do, for example, if I wanna install another version, for example, 3.9.4, oops. 3.9.4, because we've got old projects that might be using that. Uh, that goes and downloads from python.org and grabs all the stuff. If you're using Homebrew, it's gonna use all the like Zlib and Readline so that you've got all the dependencies satisfied to make sure you're good to go to install Python. We'll come back to that window here momentarily. If I can find my mouse, here we go. Okay, so we can now also do, for example, if I go onto my desktop, and I've got two folders here, project one, project two. If I go into project one, and I wanna use a specific version of Python here as opposed to another version of Python, like the default Python. So right now, I type Python, I get 3.10.3, which is that default global. If I type pyenv local, and say I wanna use 3.9.11, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you'll notice my prompt actually automatically updated over there on the right side <clears throat> to show that I'm using 3.9.11. And now when I type the word Python, I get 3.9.11 by default. So I'm in full control of my environments here. I know where it's coming from, it's explicit. I have said I wanna use this version of Python when I'm in this version, this folder. Oops, if I uh, go up a directory, uh, you'll see that the 3.9.11 went away <clears throat> and when I type Python I'm back in 3.10.3. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, which is also super awesome. So again, seeding into that directory, uh, pyenv is doing the magic here to automatically give me now 3.9.3. How is it doing it? Uh, it's, it's no serious magic, it is explicit. It has put a Python version dot file in that folder, and so pyenv is looking for that as I invoke the Python command. There's basically a wrapper around all the Python commands to say, I'm gonna use the version that's specified in that Python version which also makes it easy to now specify across a project, like what version of Python you're using. Although I don't think I would do that with this Python version. There are better like pyproject.toml files to specify specific Python requirements for your specific project that we'll talk about later. Okay, so that's a quick, quick intro to, <clears throat> to PyM and kind of the explicit over implicit. I can say exactly what versions of Python I want and when I want them. Uh, PyEnv, <clears throat> one of the reasons I recommend it is it has some nice plugins. Uh, if you are using VirtualEnv right now, uh, which you should be to make sandboxes, PyEnv supports these out of the box and it's really snappy and easy to use. <clears throat> if you're using VirtualEnv Wrapper, it supports that as well. I, I've, since I've started using PyEnv, I've stopped using VirtualEnv Wrapper because the benefit of VirtualEnv Wrapper was it kind of hides that virtual environment sandbox away from you and I don't really need it here. So the way you can get these plugins, if you just do brew search, PyEnv, uh, there you go, uh, shoot, too much. Uh, there'll be the PyEnv uh, recipe, but you also have the PyEnv-virtualEnv. Uh, let's go ahead and, I'm gonna make a, a PyEnv for you real quick, the virtual environment. So I'm in project one, I've set up this 3.9.11, but that's not actually what I wanna use. Uh, technically that is gonna be what I consider <clears throat> my like base install of the versions of Python, and I don't want to mess those up. Uh, if I do pip freeze right here, it should be empty. I should have no packages installed right now. I've got this pristine, clean environment, <clears throat> and I will keep it that way. And instead, I will do pyenv uh, virtualenv, and we'll make another one using 3.9.11. Uh, and 
I'll just call it proj one dash Ian Bing. Just for, oops, well, I misspelled it. It doesn't matter. Name, I can, we can use it for whatever we want. But now, it still says I'm using 3.9.11. I need to tell this project that I want to use my specific virtual environment right here. So I'll do that pyenv local command again. And I will specify proj one with the misspelled evn. And now <clears throat> the prompt on the right hand side is updated to show that I'm actually using a sandbox. And if I pip install into this sandbox, uh, for example, like requests, very popular uh, package. And now if I do pip freeze, you'll see I've got uh, four packages installed. If I CD up out of the directory and do pip freeze, again, clean, pristine environment. I'm not polluting my like system Python with any packages accidentally. <clears throat> I'm being very explicit and intentional about what version of Python and what sandbox of this version of Python. So for those of you who aren't familiar, like the, that virtual is really critical to keeping your world sandboxed off from the other projects. And I'll show that here right now. Let's, let's, I've got another project here, project two. If we go into project two, uh, I've got a requirements file in there. So if we look at that requirements file, it's gonna install requests using a, a extra called you know, use shard A on Py3. And so I'll do the pyenv. Actually, I, think I already made a virtual environment for this one, so just to speed up things. Call it proj2, backup. And if I do pip uh, freeze, it should be empty. Oh no, I did, install it already. So this is gonna have the Py3 shard A version of, of requests already installed into it. And if I go back into project one, well, I've already, already done that. So we'll, we'll uh, just wanna diff these real quick. Yeah. Well, I'll just go into project one. We'll do pip freeze to compare it to the one that's up there, Oops. right above it. <laughs> if I could, the joys of uh, live demoing, right? Uh, so you'll see there's a difference here that that chart A version four is missing from the bottom one where it was included in the top one up here. Uh, oops. Oh, I scrolled too far, there it is. This, this line right here uh, is missing in the bottom one because I've installed them in two different ways. I installed the same package in two different ways because I may have two projects that need to use those kind of subtle differences between having maybe a different even version of, of requests installed in one versus, versus another because maybe you've not run your full regression tests against your code with an upgraded version of requests. So you may be working between two projects where you need to maintain two different versions of the same package even across those two spots. And so pip, pip inf, pip inf plus, or sorry, pyenv plus the virtual environment plugin makes this like just super seamless because you can now CD between the directories. You're not activating and deactivating and forgetting, because sometimes the biggest problem I always had with virtual environments was I would forget to deactivate. I'd CD into another directory for another project. I would pip install something and it would end up over in the other virtual environment and I've like, and then nothing works. So to solve that problem, Python has a nice uh, environment injection that basically CDs in and out and lets you do that uh, real quick. So that is, that part of this. Um, now, if you have simpler needs where maybe you, you aren't just wanting to go down the whole pyenv path, since Python 3.3, uh, py Python um, has included, bundled in it, a kind of a simplified version of virtual env called vmv. And so if you were to invoke Python with a minus m vmv, which basically says, I want to run the module vmv that's packaged inside of Python. You can do the same thing with pip. So if you run py Python minus m pip, it'll run the packaged version of pip that is in the Python interpreter you're dealing with directly, as opposed to maybe some random pip that's in your path. So kind of a surefire way to make sure you're getting a virtual environment for the version of Python you're currently running is to run uh, minus m vmv like that. And it'll use the included virtual env, which is a, kind of a stripped down, leaner version of the standard virtual environment package to give you a VM called VM in this case. Now, so, some side notes here. Sometimes you've got tools you wanna get installed. Like you wanna use Black, and you want to use ISOR, and you wanna use Docker Compose, or HTTPX, or all these kind of cool Python command line tools. 
where do you like, how do you manage those in terms of, uh, various tools like that? So I recommend to folks to use Pipex. If you've not checked out Pipex, it is super awesome, super easy to use, and it will greatly simplify your life being able to install these kinds of uh, tools. So let's, let's look real quick here. I'm gonna go to my home directory. Uh, I, I already have Pipex installed, but for example, if I wanna use, uh, uh, who's here is familiar with HTTP? It's an awesome tool for like messing around with APIs and calling, you know, making GET requests and POST requests and kind of a replacement for curl, but it does some cooler stuff like it'll give you colorized output. Uh, normally it has a command called HTTP and when you ran it, you would invoke HTTP from the command line. Um, you typically pip, and the instructions may tell you to pip install HTTP, but I'll, I'll implore you to install pipx first and do pipx install uh, HTTP. And this is gonna create in the background for you another little virtual environment, sandboxed away, you don't see, you don't have to deal with. And then it's going to inject these three, in this case for HTTP, it's gonna inject these three commands into your path automatically. So now, you saw before where I typed in HTTP. Now if I type HTTP, it's green, and I can you know, go ahead and grab a, like a URL, maybe, there we go. And there you go. Uh, it is, you know, there's obviously a redirect to HTTPS, because as all good websites should be HTTPS, that one does it. Uh, now, and you see it's all colorized and pretty, and uh, HTTP is an awesome tool, but I didn't install it into my system Python. I didn't use sudo to install it. I didn't even install it using like a user flag, which I'll talk about here in a second. I've installed it into its own little um, environment that is now managed just by, H by pipx. So tools, like you see here, I've got black, isort, pipenv, uh, watchdog, which has a watch me do thing. Cool command line tools like that totally deserve to be installed via pipx and not put into a virtual environment or into some other kind of non-standard place. There's a good consistent way to do this. Uh, so that was pipx, the kind of pipx, let's do some damage, I just showed you that. All right, and I mentioned this just briefly and if you didn't catch it, what about this user scheme? Uh, there is, in Python, the ability to pip install packages with a dash dash user, pack, user flag there. And this is, allows you to install without using sudo, so you're following like my number one rule, don't install using sudo, but you're installing into a Python environment or location in your home directory that basically gives you one version of whatever you just installed. So if you're using requests 23 and you need requests 22 for another project, using this uh, pip install dash dash user, you know, request SQL 22, you know, 0 0.22, uh, will end up overriding the already installed version because basically it's just one little sandbox thing. I, I find this just, again, confusing for folks who have never seen it. It may be an allure of a way to like not use sudo to install a package, but you may end up with, for example, if I installed HTTP into, with the user scheme, and then I proceeded to install another tool that had a conflicting version of a dependency using the user scheme, I would break my HTTP and no longer have the working script. So again, not a good place to be installing packages. Leverage tools like pipx for installing your command line tools because it keeps them all separate. They all have their own dependencies, no conflicts there. And when you're using your projects, make sure you're using the virtual environments uh, from PyEnv. Uh, but what about, I know there's so many options out there, right? This is the mind-blowing part about Python and what makes it so hard. You know, what about Anaconda Python? Anaconda, uh, kind of the data science folks will be more familiar with the Conda package manager. Oh, it, like, it, it, there's just, again, too many options. Active State Python, uh, Pipim used to kind of a tool that was in favor and then kind of fell out of favor because of performance issues. Uh, it was interesting in the beginning. ASDF is a very similar tool to PyEnv in that it can install multiple versions of a language. Uh, in any language, actually. You can use it with Rust or with Ruby or Python, but it, it doesn't have the same plug-in environment that the PyEnv one does have for doing, for doing Python-specific work. For example, having that virtual env plug-in or the Ccache plug-in for speeding up builds. Uh, Poetry is a great tool if you're building libraries, but as a new person to Python or if you're just you know, trying to get work done and you're not in developing specifically on a library, I wouldn't recommend necessarily starting off there because there's gonna be an extra overhead of all the kind of poetry um, dance and protocol and commands and APIs that you would need to use. Uh, PDM, another you know, Python package manager, uh, kind of maybe less popular um, than say something like PyEnv. 
And then pyproject.toml is also another place where you can specify dependencies for your project. And some tools like Poetry, for example, would use that for understanding what your dependencies are. I think there's a lot of promise for uh, using pyproject.toml uh, files. That's, I think there's a PEP right now. I don't think it's been approved. But look for more to come there around build tools in Python and using that pyproject.toml file instead of a requirements.txt um, uh, file. So all that said, is I just want repeatability and simplicity. I want this thing to be simple and easy, kind of that Zen of Python. I want to be a Zen Python master. And I want to follow that simple is better than complex uh, line of the Zen of Python. Uh, one of the tools I'll highly recommend to folks is going to be the pip tools package. Uh, if you've not installed pip tools, it has a pip tools uh, compile command built into it that'll allow me to manage my dependencies for my project. So if I'm working on a Django project and I got a specific version of Django, specific version of request, specific version of this and that, uh, pip tools allows me to specify my main dependencies that I'm using in the project as opposed to every dependency I'm using in the project. Um, who here has you know, had a requirements file where it's just gotten like 200, 300 lines long and it's got every version's pinned, but you know, there's always moving dependencies underneath the covers. Like as one tool upgrades one dependency, you wanna make sure you grab all of its you know, recommended dependencies. You also wanna make sure you're able to easily grab uh, security fixes, performance fixes, bug fixes that are coming in you know, very minor versions of, of these dependencies. And so managing dependencies can be really tricky, especially if you're trying to pin them all. So if, uh, maybe everyone doesn't know what I mean when I say pinning dependencies. If I look at, I've got an example. Yeah, there we go. Here's a requirements file that has got all the dependencies for this Python script specified, and it's using a double equals to say, whenever you pip install, always grab exactly that version, and exactly that version, and exactly this version, because you know, any other ones may not work. This will work most of the time, and we want something that works all the time, so we get that repeatability and scalability, or uh, uh, simplicity of being able to install and know that our you know, six months from now, when I come back to this project, it will run again, uh, is a common you know, problem we've all had. You know, you go update the dependencies, something has broken, maybe a minor dependency happened, or worse yet, there you probably heard in the news a lot of the supply chain uh, security issues that come along with using these, some of these packages. <clears throat> you wanna make sure you're getting the exact same package you got six months ago. So PIP tool solves this problem. I won't have a full time to necessarily demo all of it, but it basically solves this problem by taking the, the cryptographic hashes of the various packages and the wheels that are on PyPy and comparing those against the last time you installed it. And pip tools allows me to manage, instead of saying, uh, you see requests right here, uh, 2.25.1. Requests has sub dependencies, which we saw in the previous demo of you know, Sharday and Certify and uh, IDNA. I don't want to necessarily specify those. I want to re rely on requests to manage you know, what it knows about its dependencies. And so I will rely, I'll, I will only specify that requests uh, is going to say, this is my uh, version of requests I want, and requests will specify the other versions. But if I want to repeat it, uh, the pip tools will actually output all the hashes for me into another file where I can get exactly the same thing over again. Uh, I think with that, I am kind of heading toward the end here. Um, one last thing, if you really want really, really repeatable, it's going to be Docker and pip tools. Um, using Docker containers to really solidify and like shore up exactly what version of Python you'll be using is a great way to make sure you get exactly the same build over and again, and you can come back to it a year later and rerun that container without having to worry about installing things on your system uh, to get things running again. Uh, if you all have questions, I will be at the JetBrains booth in the Expo Hall uh, right after this, so feel free to come down and uh, pick my brain about setting up your system and building your awesome, like, killer workstation. Uh, thank you all for being here.